Welcome back to the second part of recurrent neural networks. In this part we will first start with a simple example of a recurrent neural network and we will then discuss different network architectures and tricks to um, make the training of recurrent neural networks easier. So starting with a simple example. So let us look at this example here. This recurrent neural network is supposed to be trained in a supervised fashion and to predict the next character in a character sequence. And the way we do this is we have an input layer here. So that encodes the sequence x of t. We have a hidden layer that encodes the sequence h of t, the hidden variables, and an output layer that encodes the sequence o of t. The input and the output layer are classifier layers. So the input characters are encoded by a one-hot encoding. Here we just look at the example hello. So we have the characters H, E, L and O. So four classes. So we do one hot encoding of the input H, E, L, L into these four classes where we encode a one at the first, second and the third and the third positions. And now the task is to predict the, the, the next letter. So for each of these inputs here, we want to predict the next letter that we also have at the next input. So H should go to E, which is also the second input. E should go to L, which is also the third input, then L again. And then here we should predict O. So this is the only real prediction because O is the unknown letter that is not found at the input. But nevertheless, this each LL should also be mapped to the time shifted outputs for consistency. So the network needs to learn that too. Now, um, what we see here at the output is not actually the classification yet. These are the so-called log its. So if you take the exponential of these numbers and then divide by the sums of exponential of these numbers, then you have the output of the classifier layer. So this is basically the input to a softmax function that you see here. So um, what you should look for is that the uh, classification that we want to have, which is shown here in green, so the second letter E is what we expect here. So here at the second position, we want the maximum output because then that will still be the maximum or relatively close to one after taking a softmax function. That is not the case here. The last class, which is O, is predicted to be highest, so highest probability, so that is wrong. Then here in the second output, that's also wrong because we expect the third class to be maximum, but we have the fourth class maximum again and the third and the fourth output here are correctly predicted. So these are indeed the maxima over these four outputs. So here um, the prediction is doing some things right and some things wrong and now the backpropagation algorithm will take this into account, generate the largest error errors here in the first and second outputs, backpropagate those and use this information to correct um, or improve the parameters so that we make a better prediction in the next time steps. Okay, so this is a simple example of an RNN. Okay, in the next step we will look at a new RNN architecture which is a slight modification compared to the architecture of the universal RNN we have seen in the first part but it's a very important modification and you see basically this is almost the same architecture but the difference is that instead of going uh, from HT minus 1 back to HT in the time feedback loop we go from O of T minus 1 yeah, Remember the bullet is a time delay of 1 from OT minus 1 to HT. So unfolded in time it looks like this. Instead of having these time feedback arrows between the H variables, we now have it from the O variable back to the H variable. This is a small but a very important difference. So one aspect of this is this network is very much less powerful or strictly less powerful 
than the previous RNN. It's not a universal RNN anymore. And the reason for that is simply that in the previous architecture where we had the feedback from HT minus 1 to HT, we could essentially encode any relevant history information into HT. So we were very, very flexible what to do with the hidden variable H of T. But now we can only inform H of T with OT minus 1, so with whatever the network is producing at an, as an output. But uh, we, have, we have restrictions what we can present at the output because if we want to minimize the distance or difference between O of T and some label Y of T, then the loss function tells us what we are allowed to do here at the output. So we cannot do arbitrary changes of these symbols. These have to resemble the, the labels Y of T. So that means we cannot put arbitrary history information into O of T and therefore we lose expressiveness with this network. However, there is also a great advantage gained by this sort of network and that is we can train it much more efficiently. Yeah, remember, the previous neural net uh, RNNs were trained by unfolding them in time and then doing backpropagation in time of the corresponding unfolded network with uh, sequences, with time sequences, input and output, output sequences. And the disadvantage of that was that if we have a deep time sequence, so many time steps that we want to train with and be able to predict, then uh, this can become computationally very, very expensive because the network just gets correspondingly larger that has to be trained. Now, this is not the case here because here, um, if we just look at two time steps, t minus 1 and t, what we can do now, instead of feeding O of t minus 1 to H of t, uh, we know the reference value of O t minus 1 in the supervised learning case. We have this label, y t minus 1. That is actually an input that is given. So we can just essentially re rewire uh, this time feedback from O t minus 1 to y t minus 1 feeding into h of t and use that at training time. So at training time now we can uh, decouple all the time steps and parallelize over t. Yeah, So we can just take a single time step t and then train from inputs y t minus 1 and x t that we both have to label y t that we also have. So, so we are back to normal backpropagation of, the, of a feedforward network. We have simply decoupled all the time steps. And at test time, after we have trained, we can then rewire the time feedback loop from OT minus 1 to HT and then use the network to predict time sequences. Okay, so teacher forcing is an important trick. Uh, that can be used to um, improve the computational efficiency and be much faster and less memory consuming than backpropagation in time, but it requires um, essentially certain, certain architectures that are strictly less powerful than uh, these universal RNNs that we have seen before. Now, how can we further generalize RNN architectures? So one thing we can do is we can make the architecture itself deeper. So uh, we have so far looked at architectures like this, X, hidden variables H, and output variables O, and we had a single neural network layer between them. Yeah, so here are linear transformation matrices U, W, and V, and then we had nonlinearities in these functions that updated H and O, but only a single nonlinearity. So these are basically two layer networks and then they become deep by going deep in time. But of course we can also be deep in each time step if we have to process complex information. So one way to do this is to use multiple recurrent neural network units. So if we um, unfold them in time, this could look like this. So we have um, a deep or um, let's say at least multi-layer uh, neural network in the hidden variables here going um, from the inputs to the outputs via several hidden layers and then each hidden layer feeds back into itself with a time delay. So this is just basically a stacking of recurrent 
layers for the hidden variables. That's one thing we can do. But there are many other variants that we can use. So this again is the simple RNN we have seen before. This is just missing um, the label and the loss function to compare O and the label. But so that's the core simple universal RNN. Then this is a representation of the stacked RNN that we have just seen and we can make that arbitrarily deep as long as we can we use nonlinearities that allow us to still train it. We can use something like this instead of stacking recurrent neurons we have a feed forward but deep neural network that goes from H to T instead of a sing single nonlinearity we have a deep neural network here and we can do the same when producing the output from the hidden variables and when updating the hidden variables from the time shifted hidden variables but essentially we only have one um, time delay loop here that includes a single deep neural network. Okay, and other things we could do is we could expand this architecture by adding a time delay loop here. And that brings us to an important point. These, all of these structures here, and we will see that in more detail next, have a problem. They can get very deep in time if you're interested in long sequences. And then this function here um, that, that updates h of t based on the previous time steps is evaluated many times. And so its nonlinearity is also evaluated many times. So that means we can lose gradient information. Yeah, we can get annihilation of the gradient. Uh, because maybe we want to use a ton h function or a sigmoid function, so some, some sigmoidal nonlinearity. And if we do that deep, so if we go through many layers with such nonlinearities, then we have problems with the gradient. And one way to avoid this problem is to add such a loop here, which basically just feeds the previous hidden variable h of t minus 1 into the next hidden variable h of t as an additional input. So this, is, this is a so-called skip connection and this is closely related to ResNets that we will see later in the lecture series. And this allows us to keep gradient information around. Yeah, we don't have to use h t minus 1 in the update function here but we can use it. 